I talk today is how much should you believe in your friends. And at a really high level, what I'm going to talk about is what's involved with being a good friend. Right? Pretty important question. One that many of you have probably thought about a lot in your lives. Hopefully you've thought about it. If you haven't, at least I'll provide you 20 minutes opportunity to do so. Uh. Um, so it's rightly occurred to a lot of philosophers that friendships and intimate relationships place demands upon us in terms of our actions. Right? So a lot of times philosophers will ask this question, what do we owe our friends? And they'll talk about all the ways we should treat our friends or refrain from treating our friends. Uh, <clears throat> Really famously here, I'll, I'll give a little bit of appeal to authority here. A philosopher is a much better philosopher than I am. Uh, Scanlon, right, he, write, he writes, a person who values friendship will take herself to have reasons, first and foremost, to do those things that are involved in being a good friend. To be loyal, to be concerned with your friend's interests, to try to stay in touch, to spend time with their friends, and so on, right? So a lot of people have tried to spill some ink over what it is that we should do in terms of action and how we should regard our friends. <coughs> However, <clears throat> why philosophers have written extensively on how friendship should inform the ways we act, philosophers haven't paid as much attention to the question of how friendship should impact the ways in which we believe. Right? So how does friendship affect us as doers is a pretty um, well-explored question. Of course, there's more work to be done. There's always more philosophy to be done. Um, but how does friendship affect us as knowers is a question that has been far less explored. And that's why I want to spend a little bit of time today exploring. There is a small but growing literature on what's called epistemic partiality. I'm dropping some jargon right at the start, but I'm going to define that in a second. And this literature focuses on how our beliefs should be shaped by our friendships. And that's something that I'm going to engage with today. And in general, what I'm going to do is try to put some heat on epistemic partiality, because I think it's a problematic view. And at the end, so sort of down here is what I'm going to try to do today. First, I'm going to talk about the view of epistemic partiality. I'm going to explain the cases that are supposed to motivate the view, and actually ask for your opinions on the cases, because I'm curious. And then I'm going to try to suggest that the cases don't do as good of a job motivating the view as you might think. Then I'm going to present some problems directly for the theory. And finally, at the end, we're going to get to the good stuff. I, this is real, real philosophy. Do something negative. Tear it down. And then I'm going to build it up and try to suggest what we might take from the insights that sort of motivate this view and thinking carefully about how we could be good friends and good believers. So let's start with these cases. Um, so the first case is from Sarah Stroud. So suppose, for instance, that a third party reports to you that your friend Sam recently slept with someone and then cruelly never returned any of that person's calls, knowingly breaking that person's heart. So imagine that you're, fr you're friends with Sam. Um, I'm going to pull the audience here. Anybody have any thoughts about what you should believe about Sam and Sam's actions here? Are you willing to share with me? Initial thoughts. Wait, which one was Sam? Sam was the one. Sam's, the one, the Sam's your friend, and Sam slept with someone, and then essentially cut off all contact with that person, even though Sam knew full well that that person was really interested in Sam and was heartbroken that they had slept together and then been cut out of Sam's life. Okay, so you want to hear Sam's side of the story. You're curious what Sam has to say about what motivated him to act like that. And you'll find that if he even did, you know. Yeah, so fact check. This, but I'd like to hear what, what Sam says. Sam so you'd like to refrain from engaging in uh, false gossip? Yeah. Yeah. Why is he informed going around telling people this? Yeah, I like this crowd. Well, <laughs> <laughs> who is this person? Why are they telling me that? Why, why is this my business? What are you going to think about Sam? So you want to know his side of the story. What kind of friend am I with Sam? Right? Yeah, you might question your friendship. For all kinds of reasons, right? Okay. Well, like, is this really relevant? Like, is it something I want to know about from Sam? Like, am I going to just sort of not even bring this up? Because maybe this isn't really relevant to our friendship. Yeah, well, like, how am I friends with Sam? Am I friends with Sam because we met in AA, and I'm, like, Sam's mentor, and I'm helping him get better? For yeah. Um, or have we been friends since we were four, and we went to preschool together? Right. Nice, well, right. Uh, yeah, I like this. The texture of friendships, not all friendships look alike. Yeah. That's something I'm going to press on in a, in a little bit and suggest that the view that I'm engaging with kind of suggests all friendships do look alike in a problematic way. So I like that insight. But you want to know more about the details of the friendship you have with Sam. Let me move on to another case here. Um, well, actually, before I do, here's what Stroud says we should believe about Sam. A few candidates, right? There's never any artifice with Sam. You know where you stand with him, right? So the way you should interpret this report of Sam's behavior is just saying, you know, Sam's, 
Sam's a pretty straightforward guy, and you know, there's something admirable about that. You always know where you stand with Sam. Or she wrote, um, Sam has an irrepressible but fickle enthusiasm and an appetite for female charm in all its many varieties. I feel like some political speechwriter wrote this. I don't really know what that means. Um, uh, but I think it means that Sam's, Sam's a ladies' man, yeah. and that's supposed to be a good thing. I'm not really sure, but I, I, the way she pitches this in the article, I don't mean to make too much light here. The way she pitches this is you're supposed to try to cast Sam's behavior in a good light when you form some thoughts. And you're, and you're supposed to form some thoughts about Sam and try to reconcile this evidence you get about Sam um, with your beliefs about Sam and in a way that casts Sam in a favorable light. Here's another case from Simon Keller. Your friend Rebecca is scheduled to give a poetry reading at a cafe. She's nervous about reading her poetry in public, but has decided to do it on this occasion because she knows that a certain literary agent will be present and she knows that her work might catch his attention. She lets you, her good friend, know that she'll be giving the reading and asks whether you'd mind coming along to be in the audience. You, as it happens, are a regular visitor at the cafe and you have, over time, accumulated strong evidence for your belief that poetry read there is almost always mediocre. Why you keep going back, I don't know. Just go with it. And that it is very unlikely that anything read there would, be, would make any literary agent take notice. You had not known that Rebecca fancies herself a poet, and you have no familiarity with her work. But as her friend, you make sure that you're there for the reading. So just like uh, Stroud suggested that you should cast Sam's character in a positive light, even upon hearing a report that maybe he acted unfavorably, Keller thinks you should try to cast Rebecca's projects, that of reading her poetry at a cafe where you know, usually crummy poetry is read, similarly in a positive light. He says, before hearing Rebecca's reading, you ought to be expecting the poetry about, about you ought not to be expecting the poetry about her to come out of her mouth will be awful, right? Even though he says you might expect that of a complete stranger's poetry. And then he says, so long as it's not awful, after the reading, you should believe that Rebecca's poetry was pretty good, even though you would not have had those beliefs about a stranger who read exactly the same poem. So what's the view? Cases like these are supposed to provide support for the thesis that epistemic partiality is constitutive of friendship. So that's the jargon I'm going to break down here for you here. So epistemic partiality. Right? This is the idea that in addition to treating our friends differently than we treat our strangers, we should believe differently when it comes to our friends, such that it's more likely that we'll think highly of them and regard them in a positive light. In short, again, I'm just going to really camera this home so everyone gets it. You should be biased in your friend's favor in forming beliefs about your friends and their projects. You should believe well of your friends because she's your friend, not just because of the evidence you have that suggests, say, she's good at poetry or not the sort of person who would callously disregard somebody else's emotions. Right? <clears throat> so what does this look like when a good friend encounters evidence that casts doubt on the quality of her friend's character? as in the case presented by Stroud, or on the success of her friend's projects, as in the case presented by Keller, you discredit that evidence, or perhaps you just try to find a way to attach a favorable label to the trait or action under consideration. So this, in some sense, is a pretty radical thesis, and that's how people who defend epistemic partiality pitch it. Why is it radical? Well, there's a lot of folks out there that think that responsible belief formulation mostly involves forming true beliefs. To be good at believing is to tend to believe true things and to tend to disbelieve false things, right? Belief aims at truth is sometimes a slogan for this. Right? But if that's our picture of responsible belief formation, that clashes with the picture of what it is to be a good friend that is supposed to come out of the Sam and Rebecca cases, right? So there's a real tension here between being a responsible believer and being a good friend. So epistemic partialists want to argue that morally responsible belief formation doesn't involve just aiming at truth. It involves forming positive beliefs about your friend, even when those beliefs aren't all that likely to be true. Right? <clears throat> so defenders of epistemic partiality say, in general, so much the worse for traditional views of, how, of what belief and the function of belief are. There, there are just sometimes moral reasons to believe things that aren't all that likely to be true. Okay. So what's the constitutive of friendship stuff? 
the important part to keep, to keep in mind here is what they say is not just that you should believe well of your friends, and that's something we typically do. It's something we should do insofar as we're good friends. It's an ideal of friendship. And it's something that helps to, to make us a friend to someone that we do this to them. Right? So here's where Keller, uh, this is what he writes. Friendship places demands, demands here being the key word, not just on our feelings and our motivations, but also on our beliefs. So to be a good friend, or to really be a friend at all, you have to have these favorable belief-forming practices about your friends. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to deflating these cases. So first off, I just will start by saying this. I don't really have the same intuitions about the cases and what's involved with good friendship that Stroud and Keller and other people who defend epistemic partiality do. Um, but I'm going to assume from now on that we all widely share these intuitions, but still press on these cases and suggest that maybe they don't show what epistemic partialists think they show. So the first thing I want to point out is it strikes me that it's not all that plausible to think that you'd have no more evidence about Rebecca's poetry than you would about a mere stranger. So what the, what the case is supposed to do, it's supposed to be a thought experiment where you're supposed to hold everything equal between Rebecca and a stranger and show that you have more favorable beliefs about Rebecca than you would a stranger. But I wonder if part of what's doing the work in generating the intuitions to which the epistemic partialists appeal is that we in fact have a lot more information about our friends' characters and projects, right? You know Rebecca, maybe you don't know her poetry, but you know that Rebecca isn't, is a sort of serious-minded person who would only take on projects um, and devote a lot of care and attention in taking on those projects, right? Or <clears throat> you know Rebecca is a fantastic artist, and you think that perhaps, sort of plausibly, some of the skills in her other fine art endeavors might translate into her writing of poetry, right? So it seems sort of tough, I think, or problematic to trust our intuitions in these cases, because it seems pretty implausible that we can really peel away the details we know about our friends, aside from their poetry or aside from their sexual lives, and then have reliable intuitions when it comes to those particular endeavors. My second concern here is that you shouldn't believe a stranger's poetry will be awful prior to the readings, right? It seems pretty morally problematic um, that you might be the sort of person who aims to find faults in others' work. That seems morally vicious, but it also seems epistemically problematic, right? Um, I think here about grading student papers. Something, an, 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 sorry, an, an analogy from my life, right? When I sit down with a stack of papers, right, I have a lot of evidence to suggest that students sometimes write crummy papers, <laughs> right? And, and that's a stereotype. Uh, the students can write crummy B, B, C papers, right? But if I were to approach a particular paper thinking, well, this will probably fall in line with the stereotype, it would be the sort of thing that, again, would be morally vicious but would close me off from perhaps seeing the value in that piece of paper. It's not the right attitude morally and epistemically to take towards that paper. And I think that part of what's going on in the intuition, at least in the, in the Keller case, that you shouldn't believe her poetry is going to be awful, well, it's because you shouldn't really believe that of anybody's poetry before you've heard it. So um, I'm going to move on from deflating the cases and engage directly with some problems for epistemic partialists. The first problem, I think, is just pretty straightforward. Uh, comes out of reflection on our own lives and friendships, or at least my own life, my own life and friendships. Um, it just doesn't seem to fit widely with the phenomenon of friendship. I have a lot of friends that I turn to, um, exactly for the reason that I find them refreshingly honest and sometimes brutally, brutally so. Right? Um, they're the sort of person who I can count on for an honest appraisal of where I'm at in life and um, what I'm doing, and I really appreciate that about the friendship, and it's part of what makes that, for, at least for me, and hopefully for that friend, um, or those friends, a really important relationship in our lives. So it strikes me that there can be friendships, and even perhaps ideal friendships, that don't meet the supposed demands that are supposed to characterize friendship according to epistemic partialists. Here's, I think, an even more problematic issue. <clears throat> right? So first off, imagine you're Rebecca, and somehow, God's eye view, you find out that your friend has believed that you have good poetry, not because your poetry was all that good, but because it's your friend. Right? They're your friend. I, I would find that to be sort of insulting. Right? Um, it's, it sort of reminds me of maturing and creating distance from your parents. 
and the praise or, or your caregivers if you were fortunate enough to have that praise. And you start to think, well, well, maybe mom thought I was better at this than I was, or maybe dad thought I was better at this than I actually am, right? And sometimes that can sort of feel like a betrayal, right? It's to think, well, you weren't really honest with me. I appreciate the love and concern, but that is sort of, in a sense, perhaps insulting, right? I want to know how I actually did, not that you love me unconditionally, right? And there are other ways, perhaps, of expressing that unconditional love. Furthermore, right, it's not only that it can insult us, these sorts of belief-forming patterns, um, if our friends widely adopted them, I think could actually be pretty damaging to our development, right? So again, think of like a child case, a mom who just dotes on her little Chucky, and Chucky's great. Chucky's a moral monster, right? You have to be honest with your children at some point. And the same, I think, is true of our friends, right? We can imagine in the Re Rebecca case, if her friends all came to her poetry reading and it was pretty mediocre, but they all reported that it was great, that Rebecca might continue to devote her time to poetry, when in reality, it'd probably be better for Rebecca and for the aesthetic world if Rebecca devoted her time to other endeavors, right? So, and I think it can give rise to insult and injury, and to make matters a little worse, I think it can also create injury for us if we adopt those practices. We start to become the people, right, who in a particular instance aren't really tracking the truth with our beliefs about friends, and those sorts, the, that, that pattern, if it becomes a pattern, as Keller and Strauss suggest it should, I think might um, sort of pave the way to problematic or deferential or social <coughs> relationships, right? So if your friend does really have a problematic character, but you're always casting that in a good light, you might continue to be friends with someone who would probably be better for you to distance yourself from. So I think there's some danger for the people who adopt these belief-forming practices as well. <coughs> um, I'm going to skip beyond the last problem here, because I'm running a little short on time, and get to the positive upshot that I have here. Um, so I, I, I just want to leave off by trying to build this view back up. Um, I think it's sort of silly to think that norms of friendship don't extend into the, the cognitive and perhaps even into our belief practices. Um, why? Well, in part, it's because a lot of the work that careful social psychologists have done that show us how we believe about ourselves and about others is ultimately going to impact how we treat ourselves and others. So once we admit that it's important to look at how we treat people, I think we've already gone all the way to admitting that it's important to look at how we believe about people, and in particular, our friends. But that being said, I wonder if we can move away from this idea that we have to have belief-forming practices that are partial to our friends and move to something a little weaker. And I'll leave off with one like, last little case here. Um, I think, again, in terms, I don't have kids, but these cases are sort of rich and interesting and fun to think about. Um, but I imagine it's the case of a parent who leaves town for the first time and leaves their teenager at home, right? Um, the, and and the, the parent is trying to, you know, contemplate whether that's a good idea, and ultimately they decide it's time to trust, you know, 17-year-old Chucky uh, to stay at home, and so they leave. Does it seem reasonable to think that the parent has good evidence to believe that Chucky will remain at home alone the entire time out of town? given evidence about teenagers? Probably not, right? But I think the parent can still get a lot of the goods epistemic partialists aim at, which is the goods of shoring up our love of our friends and family, standing with them, casting our lot with them, by not going all the way to belief, but by weakening it to something else like, you know, planning your life as if Chucky will be at home alone, even if you don't believe that Chucky will be at home alone. So you're not gonna send spies out to check on him while you're out of town. Um, you're not going to text him covertly, because that would really break down the trust. So, in sum, I think epistemic partiality is a promising view, uh, but I think it has some problems, and I think we can draw the spirit of the view down a more promising route.